So I apologize for the delay. Thank you all for coming. Um, as I said, we are uh, still figuring out the video streaming, and uh, that uh, took some precedence. My name is Daniel Reek. I work in the office of the CTO at Red Hat on the topic of AI, um, running the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence at Red Hat. And I'll be talking about our open source AI vision. If I can All right, so what are we talking about here? Oh great. Now it works. <laughs> So what are we talking about? AI. I'll use AI as a shorthand for the whole, uh, you know, broader sense of the buzzword. Um, big data analytics, machine learning, uh, cognitive systems. Um, we'll talk primarily about machine learning, but I'll just simplify it by calling it AI. Um, overall, so we see AI in, in Red as one of the biggest changes in industry, uh, probably the biggest change since the Industrial Revolution, um, because we are we see a new way of automation coming, which uh, you know, specifically applies to um, IT itself. Um, the, the the key is that every human task will be automated if you can describe input to output in a probabilistic way. And you know, specifically in the software industry, what that means is that you're moving from humans understanding data and relationships and then encoding their conclusions in code to machine learning models, learning from the data, and autonomously coming to conclusions. So you're taking, there might, there's still humans involved in defining the models or getting the data, you know, at least in the initial data engineering, setting it up. But the decisions, the, the deriving decisions from the data itself is something that the, the, the software does autonomously. And even in areas where you're still, so we call it dynamic, you know, an example with dynamic rules model. Um, and what you might not want to do that everywhere, right? We'll see that in many areas. We already see that in many areas today. Um, even if you don't want to do that because you need an auditable, be a very strict rule system, what we're seeing is that the rule development itself is employing AI technologies to make sense of the data. So even if they're humans, writing the rules, often they will use AI tools to um, you know, make sense of the data, do the data engineering, do this data analysis. So we see a lot of AI being used in many things that computers do in automation, and we'll go into some examples of that. Um, so it's, it's, this transformation changes how we interact with software. Right? It, it changes the role of software itself, of code itself, and the role of the um, the data um, science and um, the, the so overall, what we see, um, we, we we have a name for these kind of applications. We call them intelligent applications. So applications that you know, ultimately collect and learn from data, and and typically. Um, gather more data when you use them, right? That's what you, you have uh, a couple of common examples that all of us use today. Um, it's how we use AI and ML today throughout the software industry and all the industries that use software, that are software bound, uh, which is most, most industries. So, you know, from banking through, um, uh, you know anything with security, automation, uh, production, automation, all of that, and well, interestingly, that most of the big advances recently in artificial intelligence are are based on a use case, a business use case driven application of AI and the combination of the compute power we have with the availability of real life data. And there are a couple of examples where big um, big advances have been made. Like um, we all knew. You know, it was well understood that you could do handwriting recognition, but it became really practically usable when the post office provided data to researchers 
you know, large, large amounts of data to solve their problem of uh, you know, letter address recognition. And then it was solved. Um, you know, we all know like all these rating systems, right? They are, they are, they are machine learning algorithm behind that uh, more and more, and it's a lot of data. Image recognition is another example where it was, uh, in principle, it was, it was well understood that it could be done, right? We suddenly had to compute power to do it in the last five years, uh, five to eight years, and then the data became available and was made available, and it was driven by a business use case with a speculative application of the understood theoretical capabilities that, that got us to where we are today. And you have to, in that light, see things like when, when Amazon offers a service like recognition, which is a facial recognition service that you can use, they provide that ready to use, and they're going to uh, towns and police departments and trying to get them to connect their surveillance cameras to that facial recognition system. Right? Um, so they, they provide a free service and they get free training data back. And that's you know, the dynamic that's driving the advancement of, of technology here. Um, and uh, it, it, you can't, like, it, it, it's incredible how fast this is moving right now, how fast uh, new applications are, or the boundaries are pushed, algorithms or trained models get better. Um, we see this right now in, in the continuum of, like, the, the recent changes in the software industry, right, from a hardware-centric model. Um, we, we went to, um, it's about the software, right, software's eating the world, um, to cloud native, and then from cloud native we are going to data rules the world. Um, an important point here is that when you look at AI, right, so, so code, models, algorithms are really important, but because it's all driven by the data. No amount of algorithmic sophistication can overcome the lack of, of data. And data is, at the end, an equal in this to code. Right? You now need two halves to make um, a program function. If I write software, let's say I, I use AI in my development process, in, in a development process for an open source project, right? now I, I, um, I need the training data and the code to make it functional. And, and so now we are not software eating the world, it's, it's, it's AI eating software. That's what we're seeing right now because um, everyone using, everyone with a business use case where you have any kind of automation, you have data and you can derive the, the actions the software has to take probabilistically from the data, you will see training models being used either indirectly or directly in, in the user interaction, taking direct action. Um, an interesting aspect of, open, of AI is, is that it's very open source uh, friendly on the technology side. Most of the big things that people are using are available in open source. Most of the research, even the, the leading companies in the space, like you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, Tesla, um, some others are publishing, contributing to open source. Um, the problem is, if you don't have the data, that doesn't help you because the code is non-functional if you don't have the training data. So that's an important aspect where we have to think about what does it mean for open source, right? What does it mean, for example, from a, a copyleft point of view, um, if, you are, if you're publishing software but it's not functional, then you are potentially uh, in, in conflict, at least with the spirit of, of copyleft license. And you know, we see right now that a lot of companies are willing to share the code, but they think they see their proprietary differentiation in the data. Right, that's a shift. So, what does it mean from a Red Hat point of view? So, we at Red Hat see AI in like five perspectives. First, it's of course a workload for a platform. We're an operating system, and platform company to a large degree, um, and AI being such a big uh, transformation, something that every business has to has to do is dealing with. Of course, we want to provide the best platform for that for that use case. Um, we are also applying AI in our internal processes. Um, specifically in our software development process. So a lot of the talks you're going to see today are looking at how can we use AI, for example, to improve software quality um, by doing flake analysis. Um, or how can we use AI in systems operations? Right? You, know, you could say that you know, there's, a, there's a fancy, um, very, 
very flashy use cases like self-driving cars, which has you know it's very interesting, it's a big deal, but you know it, it's also very hard because you know your challenge is interacting with the physical world, and it really matters whether that white thing in front of you is a truck cutting you off or, or a traffic sign, right? And like you know it, it got it wrong, and the driver unfortunately died in that scenario, right? So that's a really hard problem. At the same time, you know basically uh, that that car is a data center on on wheels, right? Like all this AI is running in the car. And you probably don't want a sysadmin in the trunk. So you want a self-driving cluster to run your self-driving car. And that's a low-hanging fruit because it's supposed to be all machine readable already, right? We're, we're dealing about machine-generated information interpreted by machines, and then machines need to take action. Today, if you're in automation, in your know, systems automation, you're, you're, you're doing anything in, in, in um, SRE, um, you're writing a lot of automation scripts. Um, a lot of what we are looking at with AI right now is how can we automate IT processes, automation of computers. Um, how can we move from static heuristics to learned models in core, um, in the core products, like you know, basically in every device, in you know, down to the kernel. Eventually, we're not there yet, but that's gonna that's gonna happen. Um, and then you know, in systems management, log analysis, and um, interestingly, a lot of the same um, the same algorithms that everyone else uses, you can apply here, right? So so you know. It's anomaly detection clustering it, it, you, know, you, you can use the same things that people in trading in finance are are doing um, the next, so in, in like at, at this point like when we use AI internally of course like the so we, we, we follow our open source development model so it will be available to the community um, and, and in general um, but customers don't necessarily know that we're using AI right the products are still the same right you get a you get your rel subscription you get your security fixes code quality should improve reactiveness should improve things like that um, but then you know, we embed that actually in the product and we create services that are AI-based, at which point the customer actually becomes aware that they are being supported by AI. Um, an example is Red Hat Insights. It's a, it's a predictive support service that looks at your system configuration and it uh, will tell you if, you're, uh, if you have problems. There are rules in there that are human-generated. There are rules in there that are human-generated with AI enablement and there are um, automatic decisions decisions that happen based on AI. Uh, something we demoed at Red Hat Summit, for example, was to look um, at, so it aggregates data from customers, right? It reports your system status. And um, what we demoed at, at Summit was that the system then looked at your configuration and your performance data versus all the other customers we see. And the example was a, a degraded performance in a, in a cluster. And the system told you, oh, your performance is out of bounds compared to everyone else. You're an outlier. And your configuration is an outlier. Why don't you change this? And then your performance might get better. And then you know, we press the button, it changed, and the performance got better. Right? But it's basically using AI. And the key here is that I mean, it's not fundamentally different from our support service today right you you know if if you have a problem in, in production, you call Red Hat support, and they have a lot of knowledge, and they have our knowledge base. We have really good support people. They know how to di diagnose systems. But we're trying to augment them with AI that can basically process more data along more vectors more quickly, and then give you a faster or even predictive, um, you know, before you call, an answer to you have a problem there. Right? It doesn't replace a human support, but it gives you a lot of value before you have to escalate to human support. Human support can focus on the real hard problems where um, you can't extrapolate from statistical input, right? Things, one example, like a lot of this is basically herd immunity, right? Um, we're going to be able to predict problems based on what we have seen before. The things that we haven't seen before that we still need human creativity to figure out what's really going on, right? But again, we can augment them with a lot of content. So, so we'll basically put AI into the platform products themselves and in our support services to make, um, you know, turn our platforms into intelligent platforms. And then you know, in the intelligent apps, we, we, we are providing the same capabilities that we are using 
Right? We are running this on our own stack with our own tool chain. We're working with our ecosystem, um, the broader co open source community and the commercial ecosystem to create end-to-end -end AI solutions that we use to build this and we make them available to our customers so they can go and build their own intelligent applications to serve their customers. Right? So, it, the, so in, in, in the middle, we are a user of AI and then become not a vendor of AI in the, in the sense of like an AI vendor, but we become an enabler by providing open source source technology that lets you build AI. Um, and all of that is based on the foundation of data, right? It's, this, it's the recognition and the culture, culture shift from treating, from being code-centric, which we are, like most software companies and the open source community today, it's all about code. Our value is in the code. That's our, our mindset. And that has to shift to treat data as an equal to code. It's data and code going forward. Um, so what we're doing there um, is basically, we're doing the usual things in enablement. AI is an interesting topic uh, because it's very hardware bound. Suddenly hardware performance matters again, right? In the cloud, everything was about scale and individual system vertical performance wasn't the key differentiator. Now it becomes a key differentiator again, which is great for us because we have this en hardware enablement capability end to end. Um, there is a lot of work to integrate because, you know, AI rides on the shoulders of cloud, of microservices, of containers, and I'll talk a little bit more about how, how that looks in detail. But so there's a lot of work going into integrating and enabling an ecosystem so things can work together, right? Um, and, and we'll get we'll get to that. Um, we have, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, we, we have a talk later, and I'll go a little bit more detail. We have um, a, a project called the Data Hub, which is basically a reference architecture for an end-to-end -end AI platform built on top of Kubernetes and Kafka um, and S3 as a storage interface with Ceph as, as a storage in, in the Red Hat world. Um, and we're actually operating that inside Red Hat, and uh, we're going to announce operating it in the Massachusetts Open Cloud for the community. Um, as a, as a project. So AI is a workload. Um, you know, as I said, it's really interesting from a hardware point of view. You need to end-to-end -end enablement. Um, you need um, not only performance, right? You have, depends if you want to, uh, you, know, you need data security end-to-end, -end, right? A lot of, because data becomes so important. In DevOps, we have figured out how to manage application life cycle, code life cycle, right? That's where Kubernetes-based platforms containers are thriving. Um, now we have to figure out how to manage the data life cycle, right? Because when you're training a model, um, you want, you need to keep the, the training data for completeness of your source code for reproducibility, but you also need it for audit. Right? Because the code on its own doesn't explain anymore what the software is doing. So a lot of our customers that are in regulated industries or have you know, potential liabilities need, need auditability. For them, it's really important to, in their application lifecycle management, also capture the training data. Um, things like that. You need compliance when you're tra feeding data back. Um, for example, you know, you're, you're training a model with data. That, that model inherits um, knowledge from the data. So if there's confidential information in that data, it potentially can end up in your model, right? It can be disclosed that way. So you need proper m separation of uh, compliance and access consistent between data and trained models. And, you know, an example would be you have, let's say you're trading stock trading company, you, you, you have um, general data, market data you train a model on, and then you have customer specific data, and you, for your large customers you want to provide customized models that are trained on their specific data and the behavior of their data. That model will be considered proprietary information confidential by your customer. They don't want you to share that with other customers because it might disclose aspects of their portfolio. Right? So you need a very complex consistent compliance model um, to ensure that code, like, you know, the entanglement of, of, of data and code gets handled. So there are really interesting problems that you have to manage throughout the whole stack. Um, on the hardware side, uh, quick announcement, and you know, it's, it's a good example. Um, we, we just, in OpenShift 3.10, um, uh, start supporting device plugins, which is what you need to get um, 
uh, the GPUs and right now for NVIDIA, but it's, it's the generic feature in Kubernetes that lets you um, expose hardware capabilities to Kubernetes so the scheduler is aware and um, also figures out how to make um, the right drivers available to your application, which is a bit challenging in containers, right? You need to know which version of the drivers on the host to load the right version of the user space, low-level user space. Right, so that's really important. There's a block if you want to run machine learning at performance for complex machine learning because you will need this for most use cases. You need GPU offloading and that's possible now in Kubernetes, which is a big deal from our point of view because it, it gives you this ability to do the integrated life cycle in the DevOps model. Um, so on the core system, as I said, you know, we, are, we are looking at enabling AI in the core system. So basically what that means is we're trying to train developers to look at learning instead of static heuristics. Um, that's a research area, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit um, uh, today or tomorrow. Um, so think of you know, augmenting you know, the scheduler. It's a, a good example. One thing that's being discussed um, is in, in Kubernetes, you have a scheduler and you have a descheduler that will um, evacuate nodes if they don't, like, if there's a performance issue or something. Right now, they don't know about each other. So you can have a situation where something gets descheduled and then the scheduler puts it back on the same node. Right? Perfect example where you can, like, you can apply statistical models, but you can also very quickly get benefits from learning models um, because they can um, factor in more vectors than like static rules can. And you can have a scheduler that, for example, learns from the behavior of the descheduler. It's a pretty low-hanging fruit, pretty straightforward idea that will, uh, we think will improve system performance significantly over time. Right? Um, so that's where we, where we would move from static heuristics to a learn model. Um, the Another another aspect is um, is AI ops and AI dev, where just the complexity um, complexity grows so much. Um, example would be a flake analysis, right? If you're running if you're running a DevOps um, CI CD system, you have a lot of tests. What happens is that in in many cases you'll see a failure, and next time the test is run, it goes green again. It works, right? And most developers will just call that a flake. It's a test flake. It's something in the system or the test was broken. So let's move on because it's working again. Now there are situations where these are actually not flakes, not one-offs. It's just you know, a, a weird failure of the system. It could be a hard, deep-sitting problem in your code that just only happens on a, on a full moon, you know, if someone at midnight, if someone, you know, tortured a black cat on a graveyard. Um, not endorsing that. Um, I like black cats. But... Uh, yeah, it's it's just like these weird situations that are really hard for humans to reproduce because they depend on these complex intersections of 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 data streams and system failures in complex um, microservice systems and the underlying infrastructure. With AI, we are able to process more of these vectors and see if there are if there's a clustering, right? So the same thing happens, and somewhere deep in this vector of inputs, you see a clustering of, situ of, of uh, situations that like coincide with, with these failures. And it will tell you, oh, they're not actually flakes because you know, there is, it's, it's really, it's a full moon, right? And, and the, the log tells you, oh, it was a full moon every time this happened. And then we can inform the developer and say, oh, here is a, this is actually a problem in your code, right? It has, it has a, a, a problem in the, in the moon cycle algorithms. Right? And, and it like goes off and does something stupid. Um, so we're helping deal with complexity. Um, the you know, in in um, in the intelligent application space, what we're doing primarily right now is integration work, um, integrating existing Reddit program projects um, as well as community projects and ISVs. There's a, um, a website called Red Analytics IO where you can find some inputs, um, some pointers to what we're doing there. 
Um, you know, a, 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 a example where we are doing some work today is for business process automation. Um, so there's the, the idea of robotic process automation is kind of the, oh, I'll learn what a human is, do, is, is doing and I'll repeat it. But we're trying to help with, um, you know, see, can you, can you put artificial intelligence into business process automation um, to enable that? We think that's a valuable target. Um, I talked about data already. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the one of the key things um, we are seeing is in the um, the change in mindset, um, and in that context, right? We we if you want to change the mindset and you want to um, give people the ability to, for example, put like treat data like code, you need to figure out a way how to how to manage that. And you need to find a way how to give them, um, give them tooling and workflows which today don't exist. Right? This is no new. There's a lot of there are a lot of startups in the space, a lot of projects in the space, but there is no common workflow. So we are putting up um, the, the data hub. It's Open Data Hub IO um, as a project to incubate and integrate technologies to get to an end-to-end -end solution that's completely open source. And we're going to operate that for the community to give you a place to experiment that, to put data, to also exchange data in the open source community so we can start seriously putting AI into open source projects. Um, the, the problem we are trying to solve here is the complexity threshold, right? because um, so you know you could say oh everyone can just get like all the code is open source so I get a lot of AI tools put them together and um, then I'll use my data. The problem is that you know in order to do that you have to run a very complex stack. Um, so you know if if I want to just use AI. Um, I probably don't want to put up the underlying infrastructure, figure out how to manage the GPU hardware and things like that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty high threshold to quickly put up a, a build service and application platform for AI, right? So, so it's very easy to just put up a Jupyter notebook on your laptop and do it once. But if you want to run an actual project on it, you run into this. And this is just to, to show the complexity, it's just a simplified view of our internal stacks that we are running to do AI experiments. Right? And um, putting all of that together for an open source project is probably not, you know, it's it, it, it's interesting, but it's not what you want to do if you want to like be like up there in the in the top and define research AI models, or you know maybe you just want to apply some well understood um, like anomaly detection. Right? Let's say I'm home assistant, the home assistant project, and I want to put in um, a, a kind of nest like an open source alternative to nest that learns of my users' behavior with their climate HVAC control in in home auto, open source home automation, right? Do you want to have to put all of that up? No. So as Red, we were trying to provide this as an open source platform that projects can use to develop um, in that space. I'll skip that one. Um, so well, so the, the, the problem, I'll, I'll go in there quickly. So the problem we have is right now that everyone just goes to the cloud, right? Because they 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 overcome this threshold, right? If you um, Amazon um, uh, SageMaker is awesome, right? It gives you everything you need if you just want to do an AI experiment. You can put your data there, like it's you you'll give give it up, but you can even put data there and share it with the world. But the problem is that at the end, that's a black box. It's, it's a, they reinvented the mainframe, right? You're running uh, black box services on leased hardware, and you have very limited reproducibility, right? You don't know what they're doing. It's, it, the service abstraction is awesome because you don't have to learn how to do it, but you will not be able to actually do it on your own, which for open source is a problem for all the reasons I, I talked about earlier. So, you know, our, the risk is, and that's a starved GNU, um, so the, the risk is that we are starving open source 
if we go and follow the black box service abstraction model. And so we want to enable open source to basically run this with a commitment to have full transparency on the code and on the data that's used in open source development and a place to do that without having to do everything on your own. Right? That's uh, what we're trying to incubate with the data. Um, where do we expect reuse? And like, I'll go bottom to top. Right? So if you look at the bottom tier, it was that platform I, I showed. Like, you know, building and running containers, um, Jenkins pipelines, Kafka as a streaming, access control, um, policy, like all of that. Um, right now, everyone who is doing AI platforms is building the same thing. Right? The, the, you, you can modern, so any, you know, back in the day there was this, um, well, recently, <laughs> like, uh, the standard was like a Hadoop model where data analytics was a special case, um, a standalone cluster. We are moving very quickly to converged application platform because everything is AI-based, right? All applications are intelligent applications going forward. Um, so we'll have a converged platform, which means that you're running your applications and your data analytics in the same cluster. Kubernetes has already established itself as a default solution for that use case. So most people who are doing this are doing it with Kubernetes. Kafka is the data transport. S3 is a protocol for data, protocol for data at rest. Uh, Spark is pretty common. So they're, they're really common things that everyone is doing in that space. And uh, we expect a lot of collaboration of like integrating that, creating operators to make this easy to run on Kubernetes. Um, a lot of standardization into standard products in the space. Um, the second tier is kind of well understood AI functions like anomaly detection, right? Um, like um, uh, clustering, um, where we think you can actually pretain models generically enough so they're useful for many people. So um, you know, we will kind of a predefined library of AI functions that you can directly connect to. You can still take the model and train it further for your own purposes or, um, or you know, retrain it completely, but they're going to be pre-trained model, and we see a lot of interest even in the industry to collaborate on some of that. And then one level up, you have the actual business use case where you aggregate different models into an actual customer function. That's where people usually see their, their differentiation. Right? An example would be fraud detection if you're in the financial business um, if you're a big uh, bank, you have your own fraud detection service, and you're going you're gonna to treat that as a trade secret, as a differentiator. If you're a small bank, you're probably contracting an external service that does it for you, but they will treat it, they, the model itself and the da data as a, as a trade secret. Um, so we see less collaboration up there, but there are still options for uh, collaboration. And you know, in a way, you can look at Amazon recognition, the facial recognition service I mentioned earlier, as an example of something where they're not providing the transparency, right? They're not doing it all in open source and publishing it back like we would, but um, they do um, get collaboration from all the people who say makes that model better, right? So you, you see some uh, generalization and commoditization of use cases even at that level, but that's much less than lower in the stack. Um, the common pattern we see, you know, it's basically you have a secure um, data platform that abstracts from the hybrid cloud. Um, you know, basic Kubernetes, Linux, S3, and Kafka. Um, we are using Ceph there, um, OpenShift, um, you know, our Kafka um, to provide that. On top of that, you have a DevOps application lifecycle management that expands to data so you want so you're going to treat basically data as an as an equivalent to to code in this and for example in your you know when you when you train a model you know or retrain a model you'll package up not only software you'll package up the data with the software you know basically um, now today we we do that for reproducibility most um, 
most projects do that. Like when, you know, when you build code, you store the source code that you built the code from or store reference or package up a source RPM or a Debian source package so you can recreate that. Um, we're expanding that into containers now with a concept called source container. I think someone is talking at DEF CONF about that because you, know, you want to have the aggregate concept and then we are going to add a model for tracing data so you can reproduce exact function um, based on the training data used originally. On top of that, then you have common things like language runtimes, um, tool, uh, processing toolkits like Spark um, or Flink, and then some common services that everyone uses, um, like messaging. Um, uh, we see usually most customers and most larger projects having a predefined library of AI functions. Like we are doing that in, internally. So that would be, um, for example, flake detection is a service we have in inside Red Hat that teams can just use. You connect to an endpoint via a REST API, and then it tells you, it, it, you, know, you put your data and it gives you results back in an analysis of your data. So you don't have to. So the use case here is basically you are developer or a QA person and you don't want to learn AI, you just want to benefit from it, so you use this predefined service. You know, equivalent to Amazon's um, recognition, right? You can use that because you have data with faces, you know, pictures of faces, right? You can use it. You don't have to learn how it does it. So very simple enablement. Um, the analytics, you know, private microservices, like that's what if you're a, a data scientist or AI developer, you create your own services, right? You could create generalized services or you create your own private microservices. And then there's a data science and developer tool chain that you, you would use to do that, like Jupyter and so on. Um, on top of that, you know, just a general. Um, API routing, um, and like, that, and then of course identity access control. Um, so we, what we are seeing, talking to customers, looking at what everyone in in startups is doing, what's happening in the community, this is pretty much a pattern that everyone is doing, and uh, where we think where we think we can get uh, the collaboration. Um, the, the idea is create a meta project, so it's not going to, we're not in that project open data, we're not going to drive individual projects deep in AI, it's going to be focused on making it easily accessible in an open source context, and then operating in sense, building up operational knowledge about it, feed that back into the project. This is the goal to get access to the community and to, so both the academic community that's today using the Massachusetts Open Cloud, and we expect the goal for Reddit is to expand it to the open source community, so provides the Fedora and CentOS community to begin with and other Red Hat communities with the capability to use AI tools at different entry points, right? So flake analysis for anyone in the Fedora community would be something that's pretty close, but then also the ability um, for you to do your own experiments and develop your own AI solutions. And you know, the entry point basically could be data only, so an S3 entry point. Look at it like a, with some governance around it. It's like a GitHub for data. Um, and then build up from there a container platform where you can run things, um, streaming services, uh, an AI tool chain, TensorFlow availability, other AI um, tool chains, up to a full, full workflow of predefined services. Um, example, so, you know, just, I talked a little bit about that already, but, you know, just a, a quick example, we'll have deeper talks during the day and tomorrow um, on, ex on, on by the people who are doing these experiments. Um, but, you know, for example, we're looking for our own operations teams that run our cloud services. Um, we are working with them to look uh, at anomaly, anomalies in their clusters. Right? The problem is that traditional systems monitoring um, doesn't doesn't help you anymore. Right? You you can try to create manual rules to filter down, but you like either you're getting too many alerts or you're gonna not get the alert. You well, either way, you're gonna miss the alert that you actually was waiting for because um, because either it's lost in the noise or your filter is too tight and you're not getting it at all. Um, that's a common problem. It's just too complex, right? There are too many things, too many interdependencies. So the idea is let's uh, take some well-understood 
AI algorithms, machine learning based tools um, to train it on the data to, for example, find anomalies, right? So if I train it with the data of a cluster um, and I have enough data, I can identify when unusual things are happening and I can alert on those, which is much more powerful than a static root system for alerting. Right. Um, Flake analysis, I talked about that, right? Can I like just get so much, you know, the complexity of these systems are so, like, for human, it's hard to understand the complex chain, why something happened, or, or even recognize that two things, two failures are related because the relation is you know, deep in some um, some condition that both share that is not obvious for the human, a computer can find these things because it can just shift through all the data. Um, and, uh, you know, similar, we're doing uh, um, associative rule learning. So this is where we, we're still, so this is for humans who write rules, but we are helping them to visualize relationships between things so they can or, and you know, give them rule examples so they can more efficiently derive knowledge, derive rules. Um, another example is uh, that like, so w when you open a support ticket going forward, your supporter will know your, your state of mind because we're going to do, we, we're experimenting with sentiment analysis, right? It's, it's pretty obvious that you would do that, right? It, it's really important to know how pissed off the customer is. Um, but um, so the idea is um, basically derive more information from the information we already given. Right? Go deeper into that. Um, so um, recap. So for Red Hat, like overall, we think AI is is an extremely important trend, right? It's more, it's more than it's a fundamental shift of paradigm. Like, we, like I'm not joking when I say it's as big as the industrial revolution. And you can go beyond. So we, we, are, we are focusing very much on like on the technology aspect and the application to AI. But you know, overall, it's a big shift because it's a different kind of automation. Right? It, it, it's a big. It's instead of you know, traditional automation. It's just in, instead of like swinging a hammer on my you know on 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 my curl. Well, now I have Ansible to swing many hammers at the same time on many nodes, right? But it's still like I press a button now instead of swinging the hammer myself, but it's still a hammer being swung in the same predictable setup, right? It's just doing what I told it to do. Here, we are now, the machine is learning to do something based on data I give it and, and, and parameters I give it. And that means I don't exactly know how, I, I, I don't know how it's swinging the hammer, and I don't necessarily exactly know why it chooses that specific hammer. Right? I, it, like, it's not 100% predictable for me anymore. I'm not between the machine and the action anymore. I'm just on the outside putting inputs into the machine. And it's a big change. Um, it also, you know, it means that certain types of tasks probably we won't have to do anymore, fundamentally. So on a, on a society level, it's a big, big change because, you know, in the past you could always just move from swinging the hammer to pushing the button, but now there might not be a button to push. The button is automated away. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal. Um, we think that everyone has to... Um, be aware of it, like as a business, as a software project, as a developer, because it's changing how you interact with systems, how you interact with software, and it's going to change how what your customers expect, what your users expect from the software. Um, you know, we see a very strong trend towards this hybrid cloud container platform, which we are fairly happy because you know, with Kubernetes OpenShift, we've done a lot in that in that space. And so, um, biggest priority for us is to make OpenShift the ideal platform to run AI machine learning um, workloads and enable the broader ecosystem and the open source community. Right? Because as Red Hat, as an open source company, we depend on the open source community to picking this up. Right? We we, we are not going to do this on our own. Uh, we only one one part of the overall equation. And so we want to enable the open source community to 
um, get on board with AI and the application of AI within the scope of the open source projects to make them better. So that's it. If you want to um, find out, we have uh, we are going to publish a blog at next.reddit.com, um, and you can go to the open. Now you can go to Open Data Hub IO. We should have updated that page. And Red Analytics IO, another good place to find out what's going on with AI at Reddit and get some you know, quick starts and tools. Um, there's going to be, we have this whole um, today in this room and tomorrow in Metcalf Small, I think, an AI track with a whole bunch of good talks. And on Saturday, there is also a data science workshop run by, by Mike McCune and uh, Will Benton. Mike is in the back there, um, which uh, I can really recommend. It's a really great, great workshop on how to run. Um, it's, it's built around Spark and how to run data science and machine learning on top of Kubernetes and Spark. Um, so, really good. If you have any, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Uh, I think we have five minutes. Is that right? Ten minutes. Excellent. We have ten minutes for question and discussion. Any questions? In the back, um, I think we should have a mic. Do we have the second microphone back there? No. Note to self for the next talk, get out the hand microphone. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, will you make this presentation available? Yeah, so it, we actually live streamed it, and the recording will be available, and we will make the slides available. Yes. Any other questions? All right, let me ask you, who of you has done anything with machine learning? Yeah. Uh, have you have you used it just on your laptop or done it like in a in a in a workflow already with both? Is there, like who of you is using Amazon for that? Okay. Eh? Maybe it's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> While the Reddit people are saying Amazon is... Uh... <laughs> so, um, well, is there no questions? I hope this was... Oh, one more. I, I found the, your, your perspective quite refreshing. I have seen some um, quite chilling things that are coming out of the land of proprietary software from companies such as Salesforce when it comes to, to AI. Can you uh, expand more on the importance of doing this the free software way? Thank yeah. you. So, why does free software matter here? Right? It's, um, I think there, like, there are multiple layers to that to that discussion. Right? The first one is just, well, if we want to do it in open source, we want to enable open source to be an AI enabled. Like Kubernetes becomes a self-driving cluster. You can only, like, we need to do it all in open source, and otherwise it's not open source. Right? So that's kind of self-evident that for applying it to open source software, we have to do it in open source. And there's, you know, and, and that's for the code and the data when you go into, oh, it needs to be functionally complete, right? If we don't have the training data, then we haven't provided an open source solution to the problem. Um, so you'll, like, I think, I think, like, in our world, we'll see kind of this uh, a separation of, like, data domains in community data, and community data will always go back to the community and we'll develop, we'll see a development of some licensing schemes similar to copyleft for that, for data. Um, we then have your own data, like so Red Hat creates a lot of data. Some of that will be open source data, some of that, that will not, and that depends on a lot of factors. And then we have customer data, right, that belongs to the customer and always going to be private because you know, just by 
requirement in many cases by even regulatory requirement, unless a customer donates the data into open source, which of course is a possibility for them. Um, so, so, but, but that like in, for us it's really important like that this is complete, right? You need open source needs to be complete, self-hosting, reproducible. It means the data you do use to develop open source to put AI into open source needs to be part of open source. Otherwise, you haven't done open source. It's very straightforward there. Now, you can take it a step further. Look, um, you know, it, it, it's this general trend, right? If you're, if you're using black box services, you're giving up control, right? And that's true with anything you do in, in, a, in, a, in proprietary software, right? You have less control than in open source. That's why open source matters, right? Open source is about enabling you to understand what software is doing, reproduce what the software is doing, and then redistribute that software. Now, if you go into cloud services, black box services that operate in the cloud, that's the extreme case of your proprietary software because you don't know, you know, not only can't you change the software, you don't have input on the operation side. Now, if you go into data services where now decisions are being taken based on data and you don't even control the data, you can put your own data in it, but you lose control over your own data when you do that, you know, it, it extrapolates, so it's a control problem. You know, you get into a very strong dependency when you use these kind of black box services. You lose reproducibility. Right? On top of that, let's say if you're in research, right, you're doing scientific research, and you want to do publications, you need, how, how do you do peer review if you are dependent on a black box service that you don't know how is it going? You don't have reproducibility anymore. It's a business problem, a regulatory problem, an audit problem. In many cases, you can probably offload it, right? If, if your, your service provider is you know, HIPAA compliant, you don't have a problem with HIPAA compliance anymore. But you're also completely dependent on them. That doesn't work everywhere, right? That doesn't work in research. Um, and it, it goes deeper in where your, of course, your results are dependent on what goes into that. Right? There is this, is, I don't like the term algorithmic bias because I think, think it's misleading because it, I think it's primarily just the old garbage in, garbage out problem. Right? It's not that the algorithm has, a, the math doesn't have a bias, but if you put data into a training model and the data has a certain statistic or statistical um, aspects, characteristic of the data will show up in the model, right? And so if you have an imbalance in, in, the, in the data you put in, you will see the imbalance most likely in the decisions the model takes. Right? And um, you, the, the, the problem is that if, you're, if, you're, if you have a, a model part of your decision process in something, where the, you know, and, and, and you don't know, you can't validate the data, you're fully dependent on the people who select the data to train the model to do it right, right? So, so even like the correctness of the results depends on training the model right. So if you're using someone else's trained model, or it could depend on, on weird things in the platform, right? If, you, if you, I can't reproduce a binary platform that I trained a model on, I can't guarantee that I can recreate the same behavior. Let's say I validated it was correct, but it was correct, um, but there was like a rounding error somewhere in the GPU because um, of a microcode problem or, uh, you know, or that's, that's actually a hard one. Let's take it simpler, like in the drive, a driver run or just a parameter setting, right? If I have no control over that, I can't reproduce it, I might not be able to reproduce the results. So that's why we th we, you know, I think it's, it's extremely important just for consistency, both for, for businesses and for researchers to control the f or have transparency in the full stack and have the ability to get control over the full stack. Right? You can use services, but don't use services that will not tell you what they're doing would be my advice. And then you can take it a step further, where now we are, you know, these systems become more and more important. And then you, you, you can get quite philosophical or even political on that, but ultimately I think, it's the old Lawrence, Lawrence Lessig, I think he wrote this, uh, uh, Larry Lessig, uh, Harvard, um, 
professor, he wrote this book code, and it was like probably 20 years ago or something, or 15 years ago, but it, it all about the, uh, how code becomes law. Right? Because in the way we interact with, with the world today, our interaction with the world is limited by the code that we use to interact with the world. Right? The, you know, a common example, like if we are all in this room, that's great, we can talk unfiltered. At the moment where I'm posting this on Twitter or on Facebook, there are already algorithms between us. Right? And um, you know, if protocols don't talk to each other, they don't talk to each other. You know, if uh, um, filters don't filter things and don't show them, they don't show up. And that's another like bigger, transparency problem that I think only open source can overcome, right? Like at the end, you want to make sure that there's transparency in these kind of decisions. Right? There's transparency in, and you don't have to go to the, the big question for self-driving cars, right? The, the dilemma like, do I kill one or five people, right? Which is hard for humans, right? Like um, there's a, um, I just listened to um, Sam Harris, book on, on that uh, like, uh, for, so for humans it depends the answer depends on how you ask the question right? whether you kill one or five people um, in, in lab environments in, in a test is psychologically right and, and for machines we'll have like we will have to figure that out self-driving cars are not possible without taking that decision right? they will take that decision and I think that kind of decision needs to be transparent and the only way to do that is with open source and open source treating data as part of the code so was that was a long answer I hope it was helpful one more question two more questions okay three So I was very interested in the idea of uh, a trusted aggregator of data being a third party. Can you talk about some examples or with some of the uh, early uh, promising well, so, areas that might be there? Yeah, so right now the focus, it's, it's for open source projects to share data. That's where we're starting. Well, right now it would be like operational data, for example, for... Um, uh, you know, out, out of your cluster, or you know, let's say you want to do. You know, my my favorite example. It's something. If no one is doing it, I will do it. So I'm running my home automation with Home Assistant, which is awesome on a Raspberry Pi, um, on Fedora on a Raspberry Pi. It's important in this context. Now, Debian is you know, great too. Don't like. Um, and uh, and like right now, I have to for my my. Um, Climate control. I have to write manual rules and like with, with three thermostats and and a bunch of like like day night season people home. Like it, it, it's already too much, right? I can't keep up with that, right? So it's it's a very low hanging fruit to just train that, and that's what they, what with Nest you do, right? Like it it learns from what you. Do. I have no idea how they do that. I never owned a Nest because you know that like. It's a black box service, right? so I'm doing it myself. And you know, with the open data, you could create that very easily, a place where you can put the data with trust. We can ensure compliance around it, you know, to make sure that data gets um, managed properly. And the open source open open source project can now. Um, Collaborate on it without having to build up the stack on the you know, for um, you know, the, so it would probably fall under GDPR um, because of personal identifying information. So you need uh, uh, compliance pseudonymization. I can't say that in English, but you know what I mean. And 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 so you know, we can work together to just make that easier available. Now we the, all the, like it, 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 we're going to enable you to do it on your own if you want to, right? And you can participate in the project and just it's going to provide all the tools to make this very easy but if you just want to use it we are trying to create an implementation that you can just use while being transparent right. um, I think we're out of time but uh, two minutes so one more question there was in the back someone who wanted to oh. 
So I had a question um, about the, the practical approach of dealing with these large data sets. Um, I, I can use AWS and I can write my code that's open source and I can use PyTorch, uh, which is also open source, and, and I can provide my data and just use AWS as a service um, and, and still meet all of your requirements. But when we're talking about Nest data and we're talking about self-driving cars and we're talking about medical data, um, we've seen from a very simple example, you know, Netflix a couple of years ago when they had their million dollar recommendation challenge, that even the identified data in a very limited source is enough oftentimes to re-identify people. So when we're dealing with petabytes of, of large data sets, um, how do you envision that people without encroaching on the privacy of, of whoever is contained in that data set would even start to think about making that data open source um, because what you need, I mean, the whole premise of, of, of machine learning is the more data that you have, the better. Right. Um, data is far more important than the model that you throw at it or, you know, if you have enough data, you'll get somewhere. Right. But that inherently seems to, seems to conflict with the idea of making that open source um, specifically for these kinds of models, like you know, text-to-speech or speech-to-text and everything else. Right. So I don't know if the audio was strong enough, so I'll repeat, uh, I'll summarize. So the, the, data is the key, right? It's, uh, we, we all agree, and you need more and more data. The problem is that often you, know, you, you can identify individuals even with, with very little data, right? And, and for what we're trying to do, you're gonna, we're going to try to aggregate a lot of data right, in wherever we are doing it with AI. And the problem, you know, how can you do that with open source without compromising privacy? So I think... So we don't have an answer to that yet, right? There are some techniques you can do with pseudominization that get you there. Um, ultimately, it's you know it's it's going to be hard. It depends what you're doing, right? When we start with IT data, it's fairly simple still, right? So where we are starting out. Now, when you get to medical data, and which, you know, it's, it's already a, a, a big deal, right? So there's a lot of medical data out there already, and it's being shared, and people are not actually not aware how well, how identifying it is today. That's an, it's a problem today where, you know, MRIs actually are identifying information. They're not, I don't think they're covered in the regulation yet to that degree. And the problem, um, I think, so there, there are going to be techniques to improve how you put, separate the identification from the data that works for a lot of the simple use cases. I think for the harder use cases, we have to uh, get better at secure compute capabilities so things like you know multi secure multi part compute research like that i think is where we're, we're going to see is, uh, is going so you get to kind of an escrow model for data where like data is stored but not disseminated to everyone and you have a secure environment to do something with it <clears throat> it's it, 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 it is in conflict with the concept of open source, right? So there, there's going to be a compromise somewhere there. Um, in some areas, you probably will have to decide whether you know, you, you're going to go with privacy or you're going to go with transparency. And you know, in a way, I think it's it's an it could be an opt opt in model. Like so, for something like a self-driving car, I don't see a reason to have private data there. Like, I, th I, th I think you can probably make it anonymous enough to train th the decision systems or you know, it becomes irrelevant enough because there's so much data about who was there. Sure, like individually there might be things in that data that are compromising individual privacy but if it's everyone I think that that washes out a little bit. With medical data, it gets more a bit more like so. Location data is one thing, but medical data, I think, is a more problematic thing. Yeah, I 
Well, thank you very much. 